Does any senator in the chamber wish to change his or her vote or still wish to vote? If not, on this nomination, the yeas are 62, the nays are 36. The nominee is confirmed. Under the previous order, the motion to reconsider is considered made and laid upon the table. The President will be immediately notified of the Senate's action, and the Senate will resume legislative session. The Senator from Utah. Mr. President. Uh... May we have order, please, for the Senator from Utah. John. Mr. President. Senator from Utah. Mr. President, I rise today to comment on the results of last night's recall election in the state of Wisconsin. After nearly two years of heated political debate, the people of Wisconsin made it clear last night that they are not suffering from buyer's remorse. Two years ago, they elected leaders uh, committed to solving their state's budget crisis. And last night, they stood by those leaders for making the hard choices that turned Wisconsin's deficit into a surplus. Yesterday's election was very important. It was important because of the example it provides to the nation and the world of how a democracy should work with citizens who disagree vehemently about policy nonetheless coming together to accept the results of an open and fair election. And it was important because of the message that it sends with respect to public employee unions. Last night's results serve as yet another reminder that the American people want serious answers to our nation's fiscal problems, and they are tired of having labor unions dictate the terms of our economic recovery. Scott Walker never hid his agenda. He ran for office on a platform of reducing state spending, and Governor Walker immediately began addressing the state's problems after taking office. So what egregious acts did Governor Walker commit during his first months in office to trigger this recall? Well, first of all, his budget repair bill actually required Wisconsin state employees to contribute more to their pensions. Prior to passage of the Walker budget, many state employees did not contribute to their retirement benefits. You heard that right. Facing a massive state deficit, Governor Walker determined that Wisconsin taxpayers should no longer foot the entire bill for the generous pensions of public employees. In other words, he asked state public employees to do what private sector employees have done for a generation, contribute to their own retirement plans. Next, he required that state employees pay a larger share of their health care premiums. The new law requires state employees to pay 12.6% of their health care pre premiums. By contrast, federal employees pay at least 25% of their health care premiums. To put these reforms in terms that his liberal detractors might appreciate, the governor was just asking for a little shared sacrifice. Instead of pitching in, however, the state's public employees pitched a fit. Then, most significantly, Governor Walker formed the collective bargaining system for, uh, reformed the collective bargaining system for state employees. Above all else, it was this decision that triggered the meltdown in Wisconsin last year and ultimately led to the recall. Facing the possibility that a state might successfully limit union influence and excesses, National labor groups turned Wisconsin into the front lines of labor agitation. Now, I know that some have tried to give me a reputation for, for being anti-union. That's ridiculous because I was raised in the union movement. I held a card for uh, ten, basically uh, ten years as I worked uh, as a skilled tradesman in the, in the uh, uh, construction industry. But in fact, I'm not opposed to unionization if that is what employees truly want. I simply believe that workers should be free to choose whether or not to unionize in an environment that is free of coercion or intimidation. And once unions are formed, I do not believe they should enjoy disproportionate bargaining power in their negotiations with management. That said, Unions of public sector employees present a unique set of issues for taxpayers and voters. Public sector unions have inherent advantages in negotiations that private sector unions do not. 
Most notably, public sector unions use their substantial influence in state politics to elect the very officials with whom they will be negotiating their union contracts. As the academic Dan DeSalvo and many others have recognized, when the Ford Motor Company negotiates with the American auto workers, it is, at arms, it is an arm's length negotiation with both parties having an interest in the ongoing success of the firm. Yet public employee unions effectively negotiate with themselves. There is no distance between them and the public officials that they help to elect and expect payback from. Franklin Roosevelt understood that because public employee unions could elect their own boss. Quote, the process of collective bargaining, as uh, usually understood, cannot be transplanted into the public service, unquote. That was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. George Meany, the first head of the AFL-CIU, knew, knew that this relationship made it, quote, impossible, impossible to bargain collectively with the government, unquote. Now, these critical points were lost on today's uh, Democratic Party, which are lost on today's Democratic Party, which increasingly depends on the foot soldiers and largesse provided by these unions. As a result, we have an untenable situation where public sector unions are, in effect, negotiating against the taxpayers. After all, their salaries and benefits come at the expense of the taxpayers. The fiscal impact of these rigged negotiations is most evident in states with the biggest budget problems. California faces a budget deficit of nearly $16 billion this year alone. It has $65 billion in unfunded liabilities in its teachers' pension system and $136 billion in unfunded liability for its largest city and county employee pension systems. The Illinois Public Employee Pension System now has $83 billion in unfunded li liabilities. So far, comprehensive efforts to reform these systems and bring down costs have been stymied for one simple reason. Politicians in those states do not have the courage of people like Governor Scott Walker. And our folks here who support the unions really ought to be happy that this is happening because they themselves may not be able to accomplish this, but courageous governors like Governor Walker can. And in the end, they're better off as Democrats because you have some reasonable approach towards some of these inordinate problems that are affecting our states. Now, instead of reforming their system, those states have more often opted to raise taxes to attempt to eliminate the shortfalls. Yet most of the states with the highest unfunded liabilities already have higher than average tax rates. Despite their many faults, private sector unions have a stake in the U.S. economy and the profitability of American businesses. Indeed, they have a built-in incentive to ensure continued economic growth. True enough, they do not always act in accordance with that interest, which is probably the biggest reason why, today, less than 7 percent of private sector workers belong to a union. But nevertheless, they need some level of continued growth in order to further their existence. Public sector unions are an entirely different animal with a completely different set of interests. Unlike private, private sector businesses, state governments are not required to turn a profit. State officials are accountable to voters, but unlike stockholders, most voters do not have the same expectations to see returns on their investments. That being the case, public sector unions lack the same incentive to see their negotiating counterparts succeed. There are no forces limiting their incentive to simply maximize benefits for their membership, regardless of what it might cost their employers. In order to succeed, even the most ambitious and shrewd private sector union needs to account for its employer's ability to grow and expand. Public sector unions are not subject to these sorts of limitations. That is probably why they have been so successful. Today, about 37 percent of government employees belong to a union, which is five times the unionization rate in the private sector. So it is easy to see why Big Labor pulled out all the stops to recall Governor Walker. Public sector unions are the future of the labor movement. 
Because of the long, steady decline of private sector unions, big labor knows that it must maintain the strength of public sector unions in order to remain relevant. Yet at the same time, the states that employ them face incredibly difficult budgetary decisions in the coming years, and I believe without the ability to be able to get them under control because of the controls uh, of the major parties. Let's be clear about what it would mean if public employee unions prevailed in these fights. It means that instead of reducing spending, states will have to raise taxes. It means that instead of eliminating government waste, states will have to maintain the status quo. And ultimately, it means that states will have to make a choice between paying their bills on the one hand and growing their economies on the other. Going forward, it is absolutely vital that more states follow Wisconsin's example. States should not have to choose between educating their kids and paying the full freight of public employee pensions. During such difficult economic times, they should not have to raise taxes in order to keep their employees from having to pay a reasonable share of their own benefits. In short, states should have the ability to balance budgetary priorities without being thwarted at every turn by public employee unions that are only concerned with their own interests. Mr. President, last night and this morning, the pundits were in full gear, dissecting the results in Wisconsin and prognosticating about the election's long-term impact. To me, this exercise in democracy d demonstrates two things. First, the failure of the unions and the National Democratic Party was not a failure of messaging or money. It was a failure of ideas. Richard Weaver once wrote that ideas have consequences. That is absolutely true. And the ideas that Governor Walker proposed were reasonable ones that addressed a critical fiscal situation without undermining essential services in his state. And second, it is clear that the Democratic Party of Franklin Roosevelt, a party of blue-collar private sector workers, has morphed into a party dominated by white-collar public workers. And the American people, beginning with Wisconsin, are rejecting this Democratic Party and the priorities of its most influential stakeholders. The silent majority that gets up every day and goes to work in the private sector is losing its appetite for allowing public employee unions to dictate the nation's fiscal policy. There is one video going around of an opponent of Governor Walker's near tears in saying that democracy was denied or is denied tonight. Ah, contraire. Democracy is alive and well in Wisconsin and around the nation, and the American people are going to have their say. Last night's results should serve as a reminder of the need to face our perilous fiscal situation honestly and squarely. It should also remind us that the American people will not punish leaders who stand up and do the right thing, even in the face of powerful and vengeful opposition. My hope is that the experience in Wisconsin will be replicated around the country. To borrow from one of Wisconsin's patron saints, Vince Lombardi, winning is a habit. Unfortunately, so is losing. The unions have now had three bites at the apple since Governor Walker was first elected, and each time they have come up short. By prevailing, Governor Walker and Republicans in Wisconsin should stiffen the spines of conservatives who might have been previously unwilling to take on these public sector unions public employee unions, if you will. And by losing, those unions have shown themselves to be increasingly desperate and out of touch with the sentiments and concerns of everyday citizens and taxpayers. Mr. President, I commend Governor Walker and his efforts to secure a prosperous future for the citizens of Wisconsin. His courage in the face of significant opposition is a model of statesmanship, and I look forward to working with him for many years to come. Look, we all know that public sector unions have been out of control for a long time. And that includes our country. That includes the federal government employee unions.
where the average pay is $80,000 a year compared to around $50,000 for the private sector average pay. We all know that, the, that that's justified in the eyes of some because it is so expensive to live in Washington, D.C. or nearby. And why is that expensive? Because we've built the federal government at all costs and we've allowed it to just continue to spend and spend and spend till we now have uh, control by public sector unions who demand more expenditures rather than more ways of living within our means. There's a part of me that wishes that we could move a number of these agencies out of Washington and put them out with the real people throughout our country who have to live within their means and who really don't have to have huge Washington, D.C. pays, uh, which are huge to the average person, maybe not huge to people who work in this, in this uh, very expensive town, and where they can really mingle with the everyday people in this country who are paying the freight. By the way, we all know that, uh, that according to the Joint Committee on Taxation, the bottom 51% of all households don't pay any income tax freight. Uh, there's a method in that madness, it seems to me, but it's the wrong method. And sooner or later, we're all going to have to help pull the wagon and not just sit in the wagon and take advantage of everybody else. It ought to be done on a reasonable and, and decent basis. But we all know that the public sector unions are out of control. And the states where they have the biggest problems are the states where the public sector unions have dominated their elected po politicians over and over and over again so that the elected politicians are afraid to take them on afraid to do the things that really would straighten out their states, as Governor Walker has done. Now, instead of finding a lot of fault with Governor Walker, if I was a Democrat, I'd be saying, oh boy, thank God somebody stood up. The fact of the matter is, is that he has stood up, and he should be given credit for that, not condemnation. And I watched some of the really outrageous things that some of the people in Wisconsin a few, few of the people, of course, tried to pull on him. And frankly, uh, I am very proud of the people of Wisconsin for standing up the way they did. Uh, I think other states are going to have to do that too, or there are going to be problems like you've never seen before. You can name them. You can name the states. In almost every case, they are blue states. Mr. President, uh, I yield the floor. Mr. President, the Senator from Rhode Island. Thank you very much, Mr. President. It has become uh, a sort of personal tradition of mine to come to the floor each week to report uh, on the status of our the dangers to our earth and to our climate from the relentless carbon pollution that uh, we have to face. And this is a bellwether week. Um, this is our first week back in session in the Senate since our uh, break last week. And during that time, we have had a first, and that is reports from the atmospheric measuring stations that the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere broke 400 parts per million. The uh, Christian Science Monitor has reported on this, stating monitoring stations across the Arctic this spring are measuring more than 400 parts per million of the heat-trapping gas carbon dioxide in the atmosphere.
The number isn't quite a surprise because it's been rising at an accelerating pace. Years ago, it passed the 350 parts per million mark that many scientists say is the highest safe level for carbon dioxide. It now stands globally at 395. The story continues. It has been at least 800,000 years, probably more, since Earth saw carbon dioxide levels in the 400s, according to the climate scientists involved. Uh, they point out that the Arctic is the leading indicator in global warming, both in carbon dioxide in the air and in its effects. And Peter Tanz, a senior NOAA scientist, says this is the first time the entire Arctic is that high. He called the 400 number depressing. Um, the Christian Science Monitor also reported that global carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuels hit a record high of 34.8, nearly 35 billion tons released in 2011. The, uh, another report from the Sustainable Business News uh, is that readings are coming in at 400 parts per million and higher all over the Arctic. They've been recorded in Alaska, Greenland, Norway, Iceland, and even Mongolia. 400 parts per million is beyond what scientists consider safe in terms of human society, end quote. That goes on in reporting of a 2009 paper in the journal Science, researchers concluded the only time in the last 20 million years that we find evidence for carbon dioxide levels similar to the then modern level of 387 parts per million was 15 to 20 million years ago when the planet was dramatically different. How different was the planet? Global temperatures were 5 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit higher than they are today. The sea level was 75 to 120 feet higher than it is today. There was no permanent sea ice cap in the Arctic and very little ice on Antarctica and Greenland. According to NASA's leading climate scientist, James Hansen, that level of heat-trapping gases would assure that the disintegration of the ice sheets would accelerate out of control. Sea levels would rise and destroy coastal cities. Global temperatures would become intolerable. 20 to 50 percent of the planet's species would be driven to extinction. Civilization would be at risk. So this was a somber benchmark to have passed. As I've said before, we have had the experience as humankind of living within a bandwidth between 190 and 300 parts per million of carbon dioxide for about 800,000 years, which is going back into the very earliest days uh, of our species, even before then. I think the famous um, Lucy, uh, the prehistoric human, was 150, 160,000 years ago. So this goes way, way back before then. We started agricultural about 10,000 years ago. Before then, we were picking things off of trees and hunting small animals. I mean, we weren't even farming yet. So you go back 800,000 years, that's basically for as long as we can imagine on this planet without going back into ge previous geologic eras. So that's been the bandwidth, 800,000 years, 190 to 300 parts per million. And we've rocketed out of it. We blew through 350 uh, several years ago. Now. We've gone through 400, at least in the Arctic, and the trajectory is that is where we'll go global-wide uh, if this continues. And there's no reason that it's not going to continue because we keep increasing the amount of carbon pollution that we emit into the atmosphere. So I regret that I have to come here every week and continue to bring grim news, but 
That is the fact. And the day will come when we're going to have to deal with it. I hope that it is too late, uh, that it is not too late for us when we finally do get around to it. There is the prospect that it is too late because once the carbon is up there in the atmosphere, it continues to do its work. The uh, campaign that has been deployed to try to diminish the science of climate change, to try to confuse the public, to try to create a disabling measure of doubt has been reprehensible. It is based on falsehood. It is steeped in impropriety and special influence. And it is inhibiting the ability of the United States Congress to do its job for the American people. Not because there's any real doubt about the science, but because the special interests that benefit from the status quo have entirely inappropriate levels of influence in this body, and they are insisting either directly or through phony front organizations like the Heartland Institute, which has recently put itself in jeopardy by comparing people who think that climate change is actually happening to the Unabomber. Now there's some responsible public debate, and that blew up in their faces because at last they had gone too far. Uh, the lying, the phony science, taking the money from the polluters, the whole phony operation that they ran did not go too far. The Ted Kaczynski comparison, the Ted Kaczynski billboard was that one step too far. So at least there is some pushback on that, but that doesn't lift the burden off of these polluting industries who are both manipulating and maneuvering in Washington to prevent us from doing what needs to be done, and doing so through false and phony organizations, even if the Heartland Institute is gone, there are plenty of others. And the process continues, and it is going to be I think a very harsh judgment that history brings to bear on this generation of representatives and senators that as a body we were willing to step away from our duty when the signal was clear. We were willing to listen to the siren song of special interests. We put their money in our pockets. We put our consciences on hold. We put the blinders on about the facts and we marched forward foolishly when we should be preparing. So I'm going to continue to do this, and I hope that the point comes soon when we can begin to realize that putting a price on carbon pollution, developing American clean energy that creates American clean energy jobs, and beginning to take care of this world as it increasingly sends us warnings about the damage that we are doing is the right and the wise and the proper thing to do. So with that, Mr. President, I will uh, yield the floor. Senator from Rhode Island. I am back now at a different desk in order to uh, do the business of closing out the Senate for the day. And uh, in that regard, I will ask unanimous consent that the Senate now proceed to the consideration of Senate Resolution 484, which was submitted earlier today. The clerk will report. As Res 484, designating June 7, 2012, as National Hunger Awareness Day. Is there objection to proceeding to the measure? Without objection. I ask unanimous consent that the resolution be agreed to, the preamble be agreed to, and the motion to reconsider be laid upon the table. Without objection. Mr. President, I now ask unanimous consent that the Senate proceed to the consideration of Senate Resolution 485, submitted earlier today. The clerk will report. <laughs> 
Senate Resolution 485 to authorize representation by the Senate Legal Counsel in the case of Common Cause et al. versus Joseph R. Biden et al. Is there objection to proceeding to the measure? Without objection. I ask unanimous consent that the resolution be agreed to, the preamble be agreed to, the motion to reconsider be laid upon the table with no intervening action or debate and any related statements be printed in the record as if read. Without objection. I understand that there are two bills at the desk and I ask for their first reading and block. The clerk will read the titles of the bills for the first time. S3268, a bill to amend Title 49, United States Code, to provide rights for pilots and for other purposes. S3269, a bill to provide that no United States assistance may be provided to Pakistan until Dr. Shaquille Afridi is freed. I now ask for a second reading, and I object to my own request, all en bloc. Objection having been heard. The the measures will be read for a second time in the next legislative day. I ask unanimous consent, Mr. President, that when the Senate completes its business today, the Senate adjourn until 9.30 a.m. on Thursday, June 7th, that following the prayer and pledge, the Journal of Proceedings be approved to date, the morning hour be deemed expired, and the time for the two leaders be reserved for their use later in the day. <coughs> and the majority leader be recognized. That the time until 10.30 a.m. be equally divided and controlled between the two leaders or their designees. Further, that following the cloture vote on the motion to proceed to S3240, the next hour be equally divided and controlled between the two leaders or their designees, with the Republicans controlling the first half and the majority controlling the final half. Without objection. Mr. President, to uh, our colleagues, I announce that it is the Majority Leader's intention to resume consideration of the motion to proceed to S3240, the Farm Bill, when the Senate convenes tomorrow. At 10.30 a.m., there will be a cloture vote on the motion to proceed to the Farm Bill. We hope to reach an agreement on amendments to the bill during Thursday's session. If there is no further business to come before the Senate, I ask that it adjourn under the previous order following the remarks of Senator Sessions. <coughs> Mr. President, I note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kakan. <coughs> 
Mr. President. The Senator from Alabama. Mr. President, I would ask that the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. Mr. President, every sum on the Congressional Budget Office produces a long-term budget outlook. This is the report that they produced yesterday, which is what they do every year. Uh, and it is a grim document indeed, not a document that should give us comfort, but should uh, be a call to action, really, as to what we need to do about the financial future of our country. Uh, it's part of uh, their effort to produce for Congress uh, objective, impartial analysis. And we all will complain about this or that uh, from CBO, but they are pretty objective, and they work hard to produce uh, the kind of information that uh, we can benefit from as Americans, and certainly we in Congress need as we deal with our challenges uh, at this period in history. Um, so they, they, they lay out over 25 years what we could expect to see if current policy is extended. And these are some of the things that they find in this report uh, that uh, are certainly disturbing to us. Actually, they're more than disturbing. They're unacceptable. They are absolute proof that we are on an unsustainable debt course, and that means we've got to get off of it or bad things will happen. And the numbers I'll give you from this report, as Federal Reserve Chairman Mr. Bernanke indicated, would not happen events wouldn't, wouldn't occur because we'll have a crisis before that if we continue on this path. So this is what they found. Under 25 years, under, under the current policy, annual deficits would reach $5 trillion a year, or 17% of GDP, and would rise steadily thereafter. In other words, we'd have in one year a $5 trillion deficit. Our, this year, we expect to spend $3.7 trillion total, including uh, defense and Social Security and Medicare. They go on to make this finding. Federal debt would reach approximately 200% of GDP. That is, that the debt would be twice as large as the entire American economy. Uh, for Japan has that high debt. It's the highest in the world. Uh, it's financed because of Japanese unusual saving policies and financed mainly internally, and, but we're not financing our debt that way now. In fact, 60, 70 percent of our debt now is uh, being financed by the Federal Reserve by buying uh, uh, treasuries by the Federal Reserve, and that's a very dangerous thing because it's in effect printing money. So this is an unsustainable path. They go on to say annual federal spending would rise to $10 trillion a year, or 36 percent of GDP. So 36 percent of the entire economy uh, would be consumed by federal government spending. Uh, we're now 18, 20 percent in that range. Uh, this is an a historic alteration of the fundamental concept of our government being a government of limited powers. Uh, that, that's a stunning number. They go on to say this, yearly interest, what we would pay yearly, would reach $2.7 trillion. Uh, that's a, uh, 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 certainly a large uh, number. Uh, as I said, this, this year our uh, numbers are, we spend $3.7 trillion. Federal debt, according to the report, will double the size of the, will be double the size of the entire U.S. economy in 2037, 25 years from now. CBO agrees that higher levels of federal government debt will burden American families and destroy economic growth. We've had studies on that, Rogoff Reinhardt reports. Uh, I think most economists agree with this principle, that when debts reach uh, 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 high levels, it pulls down the entire economy's ability to grow. They go on to say, each family's share 
of the federal debt will climb to $382,000 per family, $382,000 by 2037, or an additional $287,000 over what today's family share of the total American debt is. And that's, uh, of course, uh, more than twice is, is uh, much. CBO warns, quote, that large budget deficits and growing debt would lower growth income for the United States. Lower growth incomes in the United States, close quote. According to the CBO data, over the next 20 years, high debt levels will result in $21 trillion less in economic output. This is a significant reduction in economic growth, and it's out of growth that we hope to be able to close the deficit gap. And without growth, we can't do it. But if we run our debt too high, it pulls down growth and makes us even more uh, makes it even more difficult for us to maintain the growth levels we need to get our, our economy and our federal budget under control. They go on to say government debt will also slow economic growth by nearly 1% a year on average, supporting a landmark study done by Reinhardt and Rogoff that quantified the effect of debt on advanced economies. I ask Secretary of Treasury Geithner about the rogoff reinhardt study. He said it was an excellent study. And then he added, in some ways, it understates our problem. We were talking about this very 1% factor. When your debt reaches, exceeds 90% of GDP, you lose 1% of growth. Uh, he acknowledged the validity of that and then went on to say it understates the problem because when you reach that high debt level, you are vulnerable to an economic shock another recession, a 2007 debt crisis, a Greek-like problem. Government debt, the report indicates, will also slow economic growth, uh, and uh, um, that 1 percent of slowing growth, according to numbers released by the Obama administration, and I think they're pretty accurate, one trillion jobs is 1% of GDP. So if you go from 2% to 1% GDP growth, 3% to 2% uh, GDP uh, uh, growth, you lose a million jobs. So we don't need to be losing jobs. We need to be creating jobs. And debt is a threat to economic growth. And the idea that some people have that we can continue to borrow, 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 and spend, 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 and this will create a healthy, growing economy that can be sustained is absolutely false, I believe, truly. CBO gave this ominous warning. Quote, growing debt also would increase the probability of a sudden financial crisis during which investors would lose confidence in the government's ability to manage its budget, and the government would thereby lose its ability to borrow at affordable rates. So, uh, it seems to me pretty clear that if you look at the numbers, that spending is the primary cause of our long-term fiscal imbalance, that and a lack of growth. Under both the baseline and current policy scenarios set out by CBO, spending will remain well above historical averages. So it's not as if they're assuming that we'll cut spending and that we'll reduce uh, what the government spends each year. They're assuming that the spending levels will be well above historical averages. So if we ret return those spending levels to historical averages, I believe we then have a far better chance to get our uh, economy under control rather than just uh, asking the American people to send more money to Washington. Under current policy, annual federal spending will exceed $10 trillion or 36 percent of GDP by 2037. It would exceed $10 trillion a year uh, by 2037. 
You know, 25 years used to seem like a long time to me, but as I've gotten older, 25 years is a lot shorter period of time. By 2025, the report indicates mandatory health spending, Social Security spending, and interest costs. Medicare, Medicaid, mandatory health spending, uh, Social Security, and interest costs will consume 100% of the revenues this government is expected to receive. Defense Department, zero. The Education Department, zero. Federal Highway Bill uh, uh, Fund, zero. All of it will just be in those programs. And that reveals to us the necessity of looking at those programs to think that we can deal with our surging deficits without confronting the fact that the largest, most uh, sustained growth areas are Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and interest on the debt. What about raising taxes? Why don't we raise taxes? Um, well, there are problems with raising taxes. They just, there just is. It has consequences. It weakens the private sector. It takes more money from the private sector where the money is earned, where growth is generated, and distributes it to the governmental sector, which I got to tell you is not as efficient and as productive and hasn't proven to be and has not gone through what private business has gone through, which is to make themselves more efficient, more productive, and, and utilize technology and advanced techniques to produce more widgets for less cost. Federal government has not done that. This is what CBO said, quote, to the extent that additional tax revenues were generated by boosting marginal tax rates, those higher rates would discourage people from working and saving, further reducing output, output and income. There's no doubt about that. This is not some right-wing scenario. You keep raising taxes on the productive sector, you're going to have less of it. You'll have, it will discourage people from working and saving, further reducing output and incomes. Close quote. That's an economic fact. It's not uh, a scare tactic. So it's just not something we can do. Why don't we just raise taxes? That's the reason. It weakens economic growth. It weakens the private sector. It empowers the government, violates our heritage of limited government, and is not healthy for, for American families and job creation. Congressional Budget Office agrees that we cannot wait. We cannot continue to delay action on the deficit. This is what they say in, in this report. Quote, waiting to address the long-term budgetary imbalance and allowing debt to mount in the meantime would be detrimental to future generations. Close quote. We don't need to do things that are detrimental to future generations. We're already leaving them with more debt than we ever should, and we need to get off this path. I've told this story, but back in Marion, Alabama, I, I, I was at a house, and a World War II veteran, uh, just less than two years ago, uh, Mr. Wheeler, he's since passed away, was the last person to speak. We were, uh, and I was listening to people's views, and he said he served in World War, he lived through the Depression, he served in World War II, uh, he, uh, he um, uh, lived through the inflationary period in the 70s and, the, and 80s and all of that, and the problem we faced was not the high cost of living. The problem we face is the cost of living too high. And frankly, that's just what's happened. Individually, we've lived too high. We had to deleverage. Individual families are doing it. Uh, uh, the government has uh, lived too high. It's assumed too much debt. And there's no way out of it. No easy way. There's no free lunch. Nothing is, comes from nothing. Somebody pays. And so to get this debt under control 
we've got to manage better than we ever have, in my opinion. I just, I just truly believe that. Uh, um, and we can do it. We can manage better, but it's going to take leadership, beginning with the chief executive officer of the United States of America, and Congress needs to be involved in the process, too. Federal Reserve Board Chairman Ben Bernanke, before the Senate Budget Committee earlier this year, testified this way, quote, having a large and increasing level of government debt relative to national income runs the risk of serious economic consequences. Over the longer term, the current trajectory of federal debt threatens to crowd out private capital formation and thus reduce productivity growth, close quote. The current trajectory of federal debt threatens to crowd out private capital formation and thus reduce productivity growth. And it's growth we need. It's growth we need. That will make America more competitive. That will produce more widgets for less cost. That will allow us to export and be competitive, to defeat importers by producing products better and less cost than the importers can do so. That is within our grasp, but we're getting away from that, and debt is a threat to that. Uh, uh, Chairman Bernanke goes on to say, quote, to the extent that increasing debt is financed by borrowing from abroad, to the extent that increasing debt is financed by borrowing from abroad, a growing share of our future income would be devoted to interest payments on foreign-held federal debt. High levels of debt also impair the ability of policymakers to respond effectively to future economic shocks and adverse events that occur periodically. Economic shocks and shocks and adverse events. And high levels of debt impair our ability to react to those, make us more vulnerable to serious economic dislocations that would occur in the future. But Mr. Bernanke also knows that on our current course, we'll never make it to the years where our debt is three, four, five times the size of our economy. He also stated about the CBO outlook, quote, the CBO projections by design ignore the adverse effects that such high debt and deficits would likely have on the economy. But if government debt and deficits were actually to grow at the pace envisioned in, in this scenario, the economic and financial effects would be severe. In other words, what he said, we're not going to get there. It's not going to happen because you're going to have a financial crisis before then. And we can see that. We had the President's Fiscal Commission, Erskine Bowles and Alan Simpson. They told us, quote, we're facing the most predictable financial crisis in our nation's history, close quote. Both of them signed a statement to the Budget Committee uh, just last year to that effect. And they said we could have an economic crisis in as little as two years. Um, so we've not had a budget here in the Senate. The Republican House has produced a budget, but the Senate Democrats have determinedly refused to bring a budget up in committee uh, or to bring one on the floor. We're now three years without a budget. And while we have uh, uh, trips to Las Vegas and conferences and uh, tax credit loopholes to or children of illegal aliens, children who don't even live in the United States are getting a $1,000 uh, tax credit from Uncle Sam. And we can't get that fixed. That seems to be uh, too hard to do, costing $4 billion a year. So these are the kind of things that are, Americans need to be aware of, need to be focused on. If we do so, there are a number of options that would allow us to get the country on a sound path. And we do some things that will create growth without debt, such as tax simplification that creates more growth, such as eliminating every regulation 
that does not serve the national interest and benefit the economy, but adds cost to our productive capability in America and delays uh, production of energy or delays construction of factories and businesses. Eliminate those regulations that don't make sense. Uh, that uh, we work hard to produce more American energy, keeping our wealth at home. We reduce the amount of debt we're running up, so we're sending fewer dollars, fewer billions of dollars abroad every year, year after year after year, just to pay the interest on the debt we've run up. There are a lot of things we can do that would create jobs and growth and productivity gains in America that won't um, add to our debt, and we've got to find those things. And we've got to tighten our belt across the board uh, in the Congress, in the White House, and down to every agency and department and, and government uh, entity that exists in this country and, and around the world. And if everybody does that, we'll surprise ourselves how much progress we can make. And I think it's not too late for us to reverse the course we're on. Mr. President, I thank the chair and we yield the floor. The Senate stands adjourned until 9.30 a.m. tomorrow.